from the studios of Postscript Media and Canary Media. So can you imagine the smell like right now? What What is the smell of cooking grease in a dumpster like? It's like French fries plus body odor plus cooking. Yeah, plus like if you're making food on the stove. We call it peanut butter. It gets like peanut butter as the temperature gets cooler and cooler. It ends up being thicker and thicker like this. That big glob down there. Canary Media senior reporter Maria Gallucci recently went on a road trip. And many of us eat greasy foods when we're out on the road for a while. But Maria went actually looking for the grease. That sound you're hearing? It's cooking oil getting sucked up. And pretty soon, it'll be burned in airplanes. Oh, yeah. Let's rush. Do you mind um, inter- saying your name and, um, I guess, what we're doing right now? Um, I'm Dale Brattel. I work for Mahoney Environmental, and... Um, going around collecting used cooking oil um, that gets refined and eventually gets turned in in bulk into uh, airline fuel. I read a lot about hard to decarbonize sectors, including aviation. And one topic that comes up frequently is sustainable aviation fuels. So in my reporting, I've just always been so fascinated by the fact that most of the sustainable aviation fuel that's made and used today is from used cooking oil, animal fats, grease, so I tagged along with a driver named Dale Brattel, and we met up at the Newark airport where he had his first stop of the morning was collecting used cooking oil from the restaurants there at the airport. Every kid wants to grow up and drive trucks. It's fun, trust me. To be paid for something that you're good at and making an environmental difference, this becomes the favorite job. I mean, I'm staying till I retire. They won't be able to get rid of me. (laughs) I'll keep coming to work every day until they say, all right, that's enough. (laughs) Maria shadowed Dale all day on his daily route, traveling to fast food restaurants, to bars, to grocery stores, and they saw some pretty gnarly stuff. This almost looks like sand. That's all the crumbs that came off of chicken or fries or whatever they cooked. You can still get oil out of that, so we take it all. The truck has a about a 100-foot-long vacuum hose, so to start, well, you hear the whir and the sort of the suctioning of a vacuum, like if you were cleaning a floor at an industrial facility, but then when you hit a, a, a fat pocket or get a glob of something, you kind of hear that glug as it goes into the hose, and then as you reach toward the bottom the scraping, and it's just like a a very loud vacuum. Needless to say, you'd never stick your hand in there. It wouldn't come back out, would it? This fat used to be a waste product. Restaurants would pay people like Dale to take it off their hands. But now, with the rising interest in sustainable fuels, it's like liquid gold. There's even a black market for it. But I couldn't help but think, is this really the best tool we have to decarbonize aviation? So you write in this piece, when airlines talk about burning cleaner fuel, right now they're effectively talking about the contents of a padlock dumpster kept behind a Buffalo Wild Wings sports bar. So so this is our current source of sustainable aviation fuel? Yeah, essentially. Fuel producers like Neste and others say they're, they're working to find a more viable alternatives. But right now, this is kind of the most widely available feedstock in most of the world, including the United States. It really highlights kind of the amount of innovation and investment and research that's still needed to figure out how to clean up air travel. There is a really big gap between where we are now and this sort of futuristic vision that we see in these renderings and illustrations that companies are putting out. This is The Carbon Copy. I'm Stephen Lacey. This week, the greasy truth behind sustainable aviation fuels. With hydrogen and batteries still not ready to move our airplanes, the industry is relying on cooking grease to decarbonize. How clean and how scalable is it? Maria Gallucci joins us to explain. America's green banks are preparing to unleash a wave of capital for clean energy. 
The Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund invests a historic $27 billion in projects nationwide. This could mobilize up to $150 billion of private capital for solar, storage, efficiency, and electrification in underserved communities. So how do we deploy those billions quickly, efficiently, and with the highest impact? On July 18th, Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure will host a virtual event exploring the -the on-the-ground realities of making America's green banks a success. Register for free by clicking the link in the show notes or go to latitudemedia.com slash events. Clean energy and climate tech are policy-driven industries, and anyone working in this field touches local, state, and federal policy in a very real way. And that's why you should be listening to Political Climate, a podcast from Latitude Media and Boundary Stone Partners that delivers an insider's view on climate policy and politics. Every other week, co-hosts Julia Piper, Emily Dominich, and Brandon Hurlbuck cover the nuances of government funding, regulations, backroom negotiations, and the election, of course. Political Climate is a show for people who want authentic conversations and strong opinions From voices across the political spectrum, listen at latitudemedia.com or subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts. So I've been paying attention to the biofuel story for a long time, since the early mid-2000s, and I was very aware that grease collection was getting more valuable, getting a lot more sophisticated. But the thing that really blew my mind about this story is that this is what the airlines are relying on to decarbonize. I really had no idea that this was the primary source of drop-in fuels for airlines. Did did that surprise you too when you found that out? It sort of surprised me in the simplicity of it because when I cover efforts to decarbonize aviation, it's always very high-tech. You see these very slick renderings of a hydrogen-powered jet or a battery-powered plane or something that looks different than the planes that are flown today. And then kind of learning more about the source of sustainable aviation fuel today, it did, I was kind of surprised at how sort of low tech it was. But but in, in reporting on this, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you as an airline are facing a lot of pressure to clean up your operations to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that you're producing, Used cooking oil fuels already exist. They're already produced at wide scale, albeit for the road transportation market. And so it's something that you can kind of tap into now as you, in theory, are working to develop um, longer-term solutions for aviation. How many Dales are out there across America driving around collecting this grease? I don't know how many across America, but... Um, Mahoney Environmental, which is the company that Dale works for and is a subsidiary of Nesty, has hundreds of drivers and growing. Last year alone, they doubled their workforce and are adding even more locations that they collect grease from. So once this beef, tallow, cooking oil, pork fat gets collected, it gets turned into a fuel known as HEFA, which stands for hydro-processed esters and fatty acids. So what happens to the oil once it gets sucked up from these restaurants? How, do, how does it actually get recycled and turned into jet fuel? Sure. So the, the oil and the grease that Dale collects goes to a central processing facility first, where it's sort of the impurities are removed, it's cleaned up, and then it's moved to a refinery where... The HEFA process, it's energy intensive, involves the use of hydrogen, turns this feedstock into an oil that's essentially very similar chemically to diesel and is able to be dropped in directly to existing engines, be it a jet engine or a truck engine. And that's a big difference over biodiesel, which needs to be blended with petroleum products because of its different chemical characteristics. So you can go from the a vat in the kitchen of a Burger King, take it to a refinery, and out comes a a chemical, an ingredient that looks very similar to diesel. So what actually determines whether this grease gets turned into a biodiesel or a sustainable aviation fuel? Like, is is it purely economics and that the airlines are willing to pay more? It's kind of purely an economic or um, a market based decision. Right now, there is increasing demand for renewable diesel for trucks for for this reason that you can kind of drop it in directly rather than having to blend it. So there's kind of environmental benefits to doing that. Also, you can sell more renewable diesel in and of itself if you're not having to blend it. But with more tax credits, more incentives coming out for sustainable aviation fuel, there is an increased incentive to both make more of the fuel and also perhaps shift some production from renewable diesel 
to sustainable aviation fuel. Basically, wherever fuel producers can get more money for their product is where they'll follow. There are a handful of refineries around the world that can turn this grease into sustainable aviation fuel. How much are they actually processing, and how much has that production ramped up in recent years? Globally, fuel producers made about 80 million gallons of sustainable aviation fuel, which is up 200% from the amount that they produced in 2021. And it's still a very tiny amount relative to how much uh, petroleum-based jet fuel the aviation industry uses. It's less than 1%. But with more refineries coming online, with more production ramping up, industry estimates say that perhaps sustainable aviation fuel could equal about 10% of total jet fuel demand by 2030, which is a pretty big step up from where it is today. 80 million gallons sounds like a lot of fuel. But the big question is if this process can scale to meet the needs of the zero-carbon airlines of the future. After the break, are HEFAs really the future of decarbonizing aviation? And what other technologies are out there to clean up the industry? On July 18th, join Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure as we take a deep dive into the next phase of deploying the $27 billion Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. We'll provide practical insights for the state agencies and local lenders at the front lines of dispensing these funds. Where are the bottlenecks? How do we balance speed with transparency? And can America's green banks live up to the expectations of both local communities and Wall Street? Latitude Media Stephen Lacey, Banyan co-founder Amanda Lee, and Clean Energy Fund of Texas EVP Billy Briscoe will answer these questions and more on July 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern. This is a must-attend for project developers and financiers. Register for free at latitudemedia.com slash events or click the link in the show notes. I'm Julia Piper. I'm Brandon Hurlbut. And I'm Emily Dominich. A little over a year ago, political climate took a break so we could focus on the groundwork of implementing America's biggest ever climate bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm excited to say, political climate is back. And I'll be joined by my two co-hosts to riff on the top political stories and insider scoops from state houses to the halls of Congress to regulatory agencies and even international climate talks. We'll explain how those developments are driving industry decisions today. Political Climate is a show for people who want authentic conversations. And to learn about how energy and climate policy is shaped within both political parties from the people who have actually helped shape it. So join me, Brandon, and Emily every other week, starting in April, for fresh episodes of Political Climate. Subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. So let's just talk about scale here. This process is pretty straightforward. There's a lot of infrastructure to take this cooking oil to process it, but it just doesn't sound like it can scale. So how much grease and cooking oil do we actually have out there that could be turned into aviation fuels? One estimate by the International Council on Clean Transportation is about 2%. About If we used all of the used cooking oil and animal fats, that could account for about 2% of sustainable aviation fuel. The industry is going to need to produce billions of gallons every year of this fuel if it's going to replace petroleum based jet fuel. And so even though used cooking oil is a big fraction of SAF right now, in the future, it it will ultimately only be a small percentage. As these things always are, the emissions picture, I'm sure, is quite complicated um, and can be difficult to calculate. So what is the commonly accepted emissions impact of these greasy fuels? Like, why is the math so complicated? So one estimate uh, that I cited in my story is from California, which has the low carbon fuel standard and takes a close look at the emissions profiles of a lot of different fuels. They estimate that renewable diesel made from used cooking oil, which is uh, very similar to sustainable aviation fuel, has a life cycle emissions factor of 15 to 20 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent, uh, or essentially one-fifth the CO2 footprint of petroleum-based diesel. So it is substantially less carbon intensive by that metric, but there are a lot of other factors that are kind of difficult to capture in a number like that. One of them is this idea of displacement emissions. So you have this used cooking oil, you could have used it to make food for livestock. Instead, you use it for sustainable aviation fuel. Well, now you have to go and perhaps harvest more corn and soy to make that food for the livestock, and therefore you're increasing agricultural emissions and productions. Also, if you're using the used cooking oil to make fuel for airplanes instead of trucks, Perhaps you're just shifting the benefits instead of creating more benefits for the climate. One of the experts I talked to said, well, even though it's 
call it a waste product, right? Because used cooking oil is generated from kitchens as a waste product. It's not truly waste because there's always something that could be done with it. And what you choose to do with it will kind of, and the ripple effect that has will have a big determination on what the ultimate emissions profile of that fuel is. So there's this other big question wrapped up in the use of these cooking oils, which is that their original source is from industrial livestock production, industrial agriculture, and there's all sorts of animal welfare and environmental questions around that industry. So how does that tie into our assessment of the value of these fuels? Yeah, there's this underlying tension that the the oils and greases and fats come from industrial agriculture and industrial livestock production, and those in and of themselves are very um, emissions-intensive processes. They also have big environmental impacts on water quality, air quality, uh, animal welfare. So use cooking oil as a waste product, but if you take it all the way back to the beginning, there's also sort of this other layer to consider in terms of emissions and environmental impacts. So this is a small piece of decarbonization efforts in the airline industry. This is only a couple percent of actual fuel needs. So what do the airlines actually need to do beyond that? There's there's potentially electrifying regional transport. There's use of hydrogen. What are the tools that are out there and how ready are they? They're all in development, but I would say none are close to commercial, reaching commercial scale. Startups have pretty ambitious timelines, I'd say, for when their technology will be ready. Zero Avio is a company developing hydrogen fuel cell battery airplanes for regional travel, they're hoping to be able to put those into service within a few years. Fully hydrogen-powered jets that can cross the ocean, perhaps those could be ready within a few decades. And the challenge is that a lot of companies, a lot of airlines, they're working on solutions now. They're sort of getting from pilot and demonstration to commercial-scale manufacturing, but, but it's hard to say when that will actually translate into when we'll actually see that as passengers ourselves. I'm honestly still kind of blown away by this piece. You, you know, you've got someone like Dale Bertel from Mahoney International spending 60 hours a week collecting this stuff. And, you know, the world only discards so much French fry oil and beef fat, as you've said in the piece, and it's not going to make up more than a couple percent of fuels. Does this feel like the aviation industry's best path for decarbonizing right now? You know, like these technologies you identified previously, are, they're, a dec- they're decades off, potentially. This feels like the only thing that's available now, and it's really not that scalable. Yeah, I would say that's accurate. Um, there, There is room to scale. They haven't captured all of the used cooking oil and animal fats, and certainly they could shift more of, more of the production toward aviation and away from uh, ground transportation. So there, there are other ways of making sustainable aviation fuel that use materials like woody biomass, or also called forest residues, um, municipal solid waste, algae, carbon dioxide that's captured from ethanol refineries. And these are coming along in the pilot demonstration phase. A few companies are starting to build commercial scale refineries. Those haven't opened yet, but Potentially in in the next few years, we could start to see more types of sustainable aviation fuel beyond used cooking oil uh, and HEFA fuels that are entering the market. And so despite the limitations of used cooking oil, there could be still be substantial growth in sustainable aviation fuel from other types of materials. So at this point, if I want to minimize my impact from flying, it seems like sustainable aviation fuels are not the solution I should be betting on right now. Uh, Well, I was just thinking, whenever I write a story about uh, aviation, usually I'll get a comment or or someone will reach out and say, well, you know, one way to reduce emissions is to fly less. And that's definitely true. There's a very small percentage of people who account for the majority of the emissions from flying. And flying less is one easy and obvious way to reduce emissions. The challenge is that airlines, aircraft manufacturers don't have so many incentives to to pursue that route. So did anyone on the train on the way home comment on your distinct French fry smell? I took a cab back to the New York train station and my driver thought, oh, that's that's what I thought I smelled when I explained to him that I've been driving around with a used cooking oil collector. <laughs> Good icebreaker, I guess. Yeah. 
Maria Gallucci, senior reporter at Canary Media, thanks so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me. And that is going to do it for the show. The Carbon Copy is a co-production of Postscript Media and Canary Media. You can find Maria's story at canarymedia.com or it's linked in the show notes. And if you want uh, a regular newsletter distilling all our podcasts, go to postscriptmedia.com and sign up for our newsletter. And uh, many of those shows are produced by Alexandria Herr, who was also the producer with me on this episode. Ann Bailey is our editor and Sean Marquand is our engineer. Original music came from Echo Finch and Blue Dot Sessions, and Postscript is supported by Prelude Ventures. Prelude's a venture capital firm that partners with entrepreneurs to address climate change across advanced energy, food and agriculture, transportation, logistics, advanced materials, manufacturing, and advanced computing. And if you feel so inclined, send a link to this show to a friend or a colleague. Hit us up on Twitter and give us a rating and review so that others can learn more about the show. And we thank you so much for being here. I am Stephen Lacey. This is The Carbon Copy. We'll catch you next week.